Hey boys and girls, meteorologist Steve Caparata back with Caps Corner Summer Camp. We're on to episode number six of summer 2022 here today. We're talking all about these tornadoes. Let me give you a look at one of those tornadoes. So when we talk about tornadoes, all they are is it's a column of air extends down from the cloud down to the ground. It's spinning very rapidly, very quickly. They can be really big. Some of the biggest tornadoes can be a mile or two wide. They can also be really small. This one in this particular picture on the smaller side, they come in all sorts of sizes and shapes. But let's talk a little more about how they actually develop. All right, so let me walk you through it. So what you see down here moving on the ground, this is to kind of show us which way the wind is blowing on this particular day. So this is would be what we call a southeast wind, but the wind is blowing like this down on the ground where we live. But if we moved up to cloud level on this particular day, the wind might be blowing in a slightly different direction, but also moving faster. Can you see the difference between how uh, the winds are moving on the ground and how they're moving faster up above? That is what we call wind shear. We talked about wind shear a little bit in our hurricane lesson. Hurricanes don't like it, but wind shear is necessary for tornadoes. And with that wind shear, with the wind blowing faster up above than it is down at ground level, we get this. We start to get a column of air that is rotating like this. Now, when we have a thunderstorm overhead and we start to get a column of air that's rotating like this, we also have some air that's blowing up into the storm. We call that the updraft. And what that will sometimes do is start to tilt this column of rotating air eventually to where it goes from being horizontal to vertical and is rotating and now we've got the beginnings of a tornado potentially on the way. So it starts out with what we call a wall cloud. So a wall cloud is a lowering from the cloud base from the bottom of the thunderstorm that is rotating, but it's not down to the ground yet. So we've got a cloud here that's rotating a bit down at the base of our thunderstorm, but we don't have rotation extending all the way down to the ground. But eventually, if that rotation does make its way down to the ground, there you go. We've got a tornado. Now, sometimes that rotation from the bottom of the cloud starts to make its way down, but doesn't make it all the way to the ground, not in contact with the ground. If it's not in contact with the ground, it's not a tornado. It's a funnel cloud. It's an important difference. A funnel cloud is a lowering and some rotation from the cloud. That's not all the way down to the ground, but if we get that rotation connected from the cloud down to the ground, then we actually have a tornado. Now, this is real important for boys and girls, moms and dads, all of us to know meteorologists like me, we help to try and warn people about tornadoes when they might be coming. So there are different, um, terms that we use to let people know what might be headed their way. So you might hear about a tornado watch. So a tornado watch is just kind of a heads up. Be ready. It doesn't necessarily mean there are any tornadoes out there yet. Tornado watches typically last for about six hours. They cover big areas. And what we're saying is think about this if we're in the kitchen and we're making a cake. OK, we're saying we have all the ingredients to make the cake, but the cake's not there yet. So tornado watch means all the ingredients are there for possibly to have some tornadoes, but no tornadoes yet. But when we issue a tornado warning, now it's time to take action and get to your safe place. We will talk more about safe places in a little bit, but a tornado warning means that one has actually been spotted on radar or somebody actually down on the ground with their eyes has actually seen a tornado. So when a warning is out, then we really need to take it seriously. And an even more significant alert level, if you will, sometimes every once in a while, we can get a tornado emergency. Tornado emergencies 
a reserve for when we know there's a tornado on the ground and typically if it's a really strong tornado or if it's moving through an area with a lot of people. So that's the most severe alert level when it comes to tornadoes. Now, if you're with me for the hurricane lesson earlier in the summer, we talked about what the Saffir Simpson scale for ranking hurricanes. Well, we also have a scale for ranking tornadoes. It's called the Enhanced Fujita Scale. Uh, Dr. Ted Fujita was a real famous, renowned tornado researcher, so the scale is named after him. It goes from EF0, those are the weakest tornadoes, to EF5, which are the strongest. So an EF0 tornado can have winds as low as 65 miles per hour, up to 85 miles per hour. But look at this, when you start talking about an EF5 tornado, those are winds that are greater than 200 miles per hour. EF5 tornadoes are stronger than most of our strongest hurricanes. So sometimes I get asked about the difference between tornadoes and hurricanes. One of the differences is our strongest tornadoes can have winds that are higher and faster than our strongest hurricanes. Another major difference between tornadoes and hurricanes, tornadoes are much smaller in size. Remember I said the biggest tornadoes, a mile or two wide, the clouds and the rains associated with a hurricane can sometimes be up to a thousand miles wide. So a couple of differences there. All right, since we talked a little bit about how tornadoes form and how we rank them now, Let's jump into my home lab and I'm going to show you an easy experiment. You can do this with mom and dad. Make a little tornado at home. So if you can get a two liter bottle, an empty bottle, maybe a mason jar if you don't have an empty bottle at home, some water, and uh, you can do it with something as simple as that. I'm going to show you a couple other things as well. But join me in the home lab now as we show you how to make a tornado at home. All right, boys and girls, so let's teach you a little bit about how tornadoes form and the scale that we rank them with. I'm going to show you a pretty easy way to make your own tornado at home. So mom or dad, help out here a little bit if you can. I had to go on Amazon to buy these little tubes, but an eight pack was something like five or six bucks. If you Google or search on Amazon tornado in a bottle, you should find something like these. But basically, these have threads on both sides to connect to bottles. Now, a lot of times online, you'll see two liter bottles, but I found these one liter bottles at Walmart. These were like little sparkling waters, the one liter, hopefully easier for the girls to handle. So we start out with a bottle that's got some water in it. Leave some air in there, leave some space. All right, girls, go ahead and put your connectors on. And what's the rule when we're connecting things? Righty, tighty, lefty, loosey. That's right. So what are we doing this time? Righty, tighty. Righty, tighty, right? So make sure you turn it to the right. All right, once you've got that on there, good. We've got an empty bottle. Eliana's getting hers on good. Now take that empty bottle, and we're going to use that same rule, which is what? Righty, tighty. Righty tighty. All right, so we're going to screw that other bottle on. And then once we've got those on, let me check yours, Clara. Let me make sure it's on good. All right, that feels good. That feels good. Yours feels good. So mom and dad, before we start, if you don't want things to get wet, you might want to take this somewhere else where things can get wet because even with the connectors, they tend to leak a little bit. But all right, what we're going to do, once we got this done, the girl's going to flip it over. They're going to give it a good shake and we should see a tornado. Y'all ready? Go ahead and three, two, one, go. All right, so Eliana's got the circle going. Clara's got it going. Check that out. Look at that. We got a tornado in a bottle. Very cool. All right. Let's see if Clara's gets going. I think it's coming. There you go, Clara. All right, set it down, hold it, and boom, there we go. So this isn't so much about how they form, but still a neat way all you need is a couple of bottles, a little connector, and some water, and you can make a tornado in a bottle. You can try this in a jar uh, without a connector. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. But there is how you can make a tornado in a bottle. Thanks for watching. All right, boys and girls, hopefully you get the chance to try that out at home and make your own tornado. Pretty cool to see it in action. So let's get back to how meteorologists can detect or know that there might be a tornado out there. One thing we look for, we can use radar, right? So we talked about radar in some of our earlier lessons as well. Radar most simply shows us what? 
Rain, did anybody say radar shows us rain? That's the main thing I always want the boys and girls to remember. But uh, sometimes we can look for more than just rain on radar. One thing that can be a significant heads up for us to a possible tornado is when we see something like this, a radar image that has a bit of a hook like appearance. We call this a hook echo. So this was a severe storm in Livingston Parish in February of 2017, moving through Killian and Springfield. I was working on TV as this appeared and I knew that was potential trouble once it popped up. So when we have this hook echo that can often not always, but can often be a sign of a tornado within a storm. So let's talk a little a bit more about what's going on and what actually makes that hook echo show up on radar. Notice there's a bit of a notch showing up in here. So what that's evidence is uh, winds that are kind of punching into the storm, what we call the inflow winds coming into the circulation here. And then what we get on the backside is something, it's a little more of a technical term, but we call it the rear flank downdraft. So you get this cool air rushing down from the storm and then it's pushing out on the backside. And that's what's actually causing this rain within the storm to push out this way and make almost the hook-like appearance. And when you see a hook echo like this, the most likely location for a tornado is right about in here. That's that's the most likely location. So that is one way we know there might be a tornado. But with Doppler radar, again, we talked about Doppler radar earlier in the summer. We can look into the storm with a little more detail. We can look at the wind speeds, the wind velocity. So this is the wind velocity the wind speeds for that same storm in Livingston Parish back in 2017. So as a reminder, uh, here's what we're talking about when we look at something like this, where we see shades of red, that's where the wind is blowing away from the radar. So in the case of this image, the radar is off in this direction towards slide L. So you see the reds here. And then when we see the greens and sometimes blues, that's where the wind is blowing toward the radar and slide L. Uh, and then when you see the reds and greens and the reds and blues together, special, especially if they're real close together, we call that a velocity couplet. So here's a closer look at it. So we can see here near Killian, red showing winds blowing away from the radar, the greens and blue showing uh, winds blowing toward. So we now know as meteorologists, we look at that, we can see there's a pretty strong circulation. So that's another sign of a possible tornado. And here's an even more dramatic example of some rotation detected on radar. This was from a powerful tornado up near Oklahoma City in 2015. But you can see the reds and almost some pinks in here. And then you've got the green. So the reds going away, green going toward. And if we sample the wind speeds, notice here within the greens, detecting winds of 100 miles per hour, close to 100 miles per hour blowing towards the radar and in the red winds close to 100 miles per hour moving away. That is a super strong circulation, about 200 miles per hour of rotation within that. So not only when we see something like that, not only are we highly confident that there's a tornado, we're highly confident there's a strong tornado. So I showed you some of the imagery from that Killian Springfield tornado on radar. This is what it looked like in real life. Look at how big that storm was in 2017. And here's where it was approaching I-55, the interstate. Now, one thing I didn't mention so much when I showed you the enhanced Fujita scale, we ranked the tornadoes from EF0 to EF5. The way we rank tornado damage is not actually, tornadoes are not ranked while they're going on like this one. We actually go look at the damage after the fact to figure out how strong it was. Now, let me give you a look at uh, another one. This was the year before 2016 in Pankerville in Assumption Parish. You see there was a lady running up to the door. She saw this tornado coming, trying to get inside, but the doors were locked, unfortunately, at this hardware store in Pankerville. You see the debris starting to show up as the tornado approaches and boom, wow, look at that. Um, just a 
incredible. So the security camera caught that tornado rolling across. This will play back again. And this was a UPS driver who saw this tornado come and trying to get inside. Now, fortunately, she made it through okay. And most importantly, boys and girls, she was doing the right thing. You want to try and get inside if you see a tornado like that. So this Pankerville tornado is mentioning we figure out how strong tornadoes are after the fact by going to look at the damage. The one that moved through Assumption Parish was rated an EF3 on that enhanced Fujita scale. Winds were estimated to be up to 140 miles per hour. The video before, the one out of Killian Springfield, that was rated an EF2. Maximum winds up to 125 miles per hour. I kind of think that Springfield tornado could have been even stronger. One of the things that happened was towards the end of that video, did you notice it was kind of moving over marsh, moving over water? And when it's moving over a bunch of grass and water, there's not much to look at in terms of how strong the winds were, how much damage there is. So I have a feeling, given how big and strong it looked, that one could have been even stronger than an EF2. All right, let's talk about how we can look at more radar products and figure out there might be a tornado. So this was last year uh, in Lacombe or near Lacombe. So this is, here's our radar site in Slidell, a little bit east of Baton Rouge. So again, we see some reds here, winds blowing away from the radar site. And then we see some greens and blues blowing towards the radar. So that tells us, all right, we've at least got some circulation <clears throat> being detected, but is there a tornado? That's not enough to tell us for sure that there might be a tornado. We have another product we can use on radar to help us out though. This is uh, what helps us detect debris. Radar can actually detect debris now. And so when we look at this, and if you're with me in the uh, uh, lesson where we talked about radar, we talked about this product. It's called the correlation coefficient. Don't necessarily need to remember that, but our modern radars, the ones we use right now, when you see an image like this, generally what it's telling us is everything in red is similar in size and shape. So we know that raindrops, generally speaking, are very similar in size and shape. When we get something like this, this area of white and green, that's telling us the radar saying, okay, I've got something that's different in size and shape. So when I back this up here a second, let me go back to it. So here we were detecting rotation using the Doppler radar velocities. And in that same spot, basically, we're seeing the radar saying, okay, there's something different in size and shape. Then we know that is likely debris being lofted up into the air, up into the sky by a tornado. Once meteorologists see something like that, a debris signature, then we can say with high confidence, there is a tornado likely on the ground. Now here's something that might even surprise mom and dad. This graphic is showing where tornadoes are most common. So where you kind of see the darker shades of this reddish brown, that's where tornadoes are most common. So most people have heard of Tornado Alley, places like Oklahoma, in the Kansas, maybe up into Nebraska a little bit. And you can see some of those areas get a lot of tornadoes. What a lot of people are surprised by is here in the South, tornadoes are just as common if not even a little more common, especially just north of where we live in North Louisiana, across Mississippi and parts of Alabama. Over the last 15 to 20 years, there was a paper that came out that kind of dubbed this Dixie Alley. So we have Tornado Alley over here and then Dixie Alley more in the south. Some people, uh, some research has shown that tornadoes are actually more frequent, more common in Dixie Alley than they are in what has been called Tornado Alley for years and years on end. So the bottom line, I wanted to show you this is tornadoes aren't all that uncommon in our part of the world. All right, another video now. Look at that. So we see two, are those tornadoes? Well, not technically because they're over water. This is at Grand Isle. So a tornado over water is actually called a water spout. Now as this video picks up, one of those two water spouts that we were looking at is starting to move on to land at Grand Isle. And one thing to point out, you should not do what these people are doing. You should be inside, they're outside filming this. That is not what you wanna do. 
but watch how things go downhill as the winds really pick. Look at how strong that wind is blowing. And then as the tornado moves across, watch what happens here. There goes the roof of a camp and there goes an entire camp getting blown away. Now, fortunately with this tornado, as you see those flashes, those are power flashes. Uh, those, that's the electricity going out, basically the transformers blowing. Um, and you see the debris in the air, the things that the, the wind, uh, as it's kind of destroying that camp, it's sending debris into the, that's why it's not a good idea to be outside. Any of that could come flying your way and really hurt you. Fortunately, nobody hurt in this one, but I just wanted to show you this video, give you an idea of how powerful tornadoes can be and water spouts are also dangerous. Sometimes people get confused on that point, but water spouts are also dangerous. In this case, one of these water spouts moved on to land and became a tornado. All right, so before we wrap up, we talked earlier about watches and warnings. And remember, a warning, once a warning is out, that's when we know we need to get to our tornado safe place. So where is a tornado safe place? So we're looking down at a house from up above, and what this graphic is showing us is basically red areas are not very safe and green areas a good spot to be and safe. So here are some rules to remember. If you're under a tornado warning or you think a tornado might be coming your way, you want to get to the lowest floor of whatever building you're in. So if you're in a two story house or a two story building, we want to get down on the first floor. We want to get to an interior room. What does that mean? We want to try and get more in the middle of the building. We don't want to be close to the exterior or the outside walls of the building or the home because sometimes those walls will start to fail or fall apart when a tornado hits. But also, even if the wall holds up and does okay. Sometimes debris can come all the way through the wall. We've seen that happen before. So we don't want to be by these outside exterior walls. We want to get away from windows. The glass can break. Things can come flying through. That glass could hurt you. A number of reasons to stay away from windows. And you want to cover up your head. Not a bad idea, boys and girls. If you've got a helmet in the house, a football helmet, a bicycle, a bicycle helmet, put it on. It just helps protect your head. Our heads are our most important body part, right? We want to keep this safe. If not a helmet, some blankets or some pillows are good. But you see here, what is often good, what is often best is maybe a bathroom on the inside of the house. If that's not a good spot in your house, uh, maybe a closet or something. But typically, most often, we want to try to get to the center of our homes or whatever building you're in. And hopefully at school, you do tornado drills and know where to go. All right, that's going to wrap up our lesson on tornadoes. Hopefully, you learned a thing or two today. Next week, we only have a couple more lessons to go. Next week, I'm going to teach you how to track a hurricane, but how to track it on a map, a paper map. I think it's pretty cool. This is how I grew up tracking hurricanes. So I want to show you how to do it. So be sure to tune in next Monday, 10 o'clock. We will show you how to do that. But right now, if you have any questions, pop them in the comments on Facebook, and I'll try to answer whatever questions I can. All right, guys, so hopefully you learned a little bit about tornadoes in that lesson. Um, we, again, taking questions live on Facebook. If you have any of those, I did see one question come in from Ryan Bettencourt, and he says, Dominic and I are wondering which types of clouds provide warning for tornadic conditions. And then um, <laughs> another comment just popped in, but I think his second question was, is tornadic a word? Because uh, the autocorrect does not seem to like it. So let's take the two parts there. First off, what type of clouds? Well, the main thing you're going to look for, we, we've got to have a, a, a big cumulonimbus cloud, a towering cumulonimbus, a thunderstorm cloud. But we talked about early in the presentation that lowering of the cloud base, what we call a wall cloud. So really a couple of things to look for. Number one, you want to look and see if, you know, if you've got a thunderstorm and you're hearing from the meteorologist that there might be something coming, uh, what you look for is to see if that, if the base of that cloud is rotating at all and do you have a lowering from that cloud. Um, it, it's almost like a bit of a wedge. It's not shaped like this, but uh, a little rectangular almost um, lowering from the cloud base. 
And do you see any spin within that? That can kind of be your heads up precursor that a tornado may be trying to develop or you could get one soon. To your second question, yeah, as far as I know, tornadic should be a word in the dictionary. Uh, but yeah, autocorrect it gets a little goofy and sometimes things, they try to correct us on things even when they shouldn't. All right, let me see. I think we had something else pop in here, so hang on just a second. Uh, looks like this one is also coming in. In a two-story uh, from Ryan, in a two-story home, the safest space is in the spandrel. Uh, the space underneath the stairs where Harry Potter lived. Yes, I had to look that up when he moved into a two-story home. So, yeah, if, um, if you can get underneath a stairwell, that often is. If you're in a two-story home or at a school, a uh, two-story school, and you're able to get underneath the stairwell, very true. That often is one of your safest places to be. But we went through some of the rules. Most importantly, get on the lowest floor. Now, unfortunately, where we live, very few basements here in South Louisiana, right? There's not zero. You can find one occasionally, but very few basements are best. So when you go places a little farther north where bases are, uh, basements are much more common, that's your, your best place to go. But get to the lowest floor, get away from windows, and get away from those exterior walls. If you follow me on social media at all, through the years at times, I should have put a picture in, but I've shared at times pictures where we've had tornadoes and strong winds where you'll see some sort of projectile, whether it's like a two by four, something like that, literally penetrate that exterior wall. So even when the wall itself remains intact, we want you away from those exterior walls because debris can penetrate from the outside and uh, make it uh, more dangerous. All right, let me take one more peek down here before we wrap it up today, see if anything else coming in. Uh, I will remind you as always, all of these lessons, they are available on our website, wap.com slash caps corner. So if you scroll down on that page, you will see all the past lessons posted. Um, each of them has worksheets as well. Looks like Amanda Trier from our team does have uh, the worksheets that created posted for today's lesson and uh, the videos from all the other lessons can be found here. You can also find these on our YouTube page and on WAFB Plus if you want to watch on your Roku, Amazon Fire, or your Apple TV, also available there. So be sure to check that out. Uh, but it looks like we do not have any more questions rolling in. With uh, So with that, I'll go ahead and wrap it up. Uh, remind you, we're going to be back here next Monday at 10 o'clock. Uh, tomorrow, I'm going to teach kids how to track hurricanes. So everybody, uh, most people and even kids now know how to pull up a weather app or pull up a tracking map on a computer. But what about a paper map like I grew up with and so many of the moms and dads that may be watching today how we grew up tracking hurricanes. Not only that, I think it's kind of a more fun way to do it. It also teaches a little bit about latitude and longitude. So we're gonna walk you through how to track hurricanes on a paper map. Tune in for that. We'll see you next Monday here at 10 o'clock. See you then.